Thank you very much, Francis, Judy, appreciate you. Gentlemen, uh, you should be very familiar. We're just in a little bit different atmosphere. To everybody out there in the ePart Trades uh, uh, stream, welcome. You are about to learn a whole lot about ring seal and machining from the people who know the most about it. Lake Speed, Keith Jones, Ed Keebler. As I referenced, uh, we have spent a lot of time together out on the NHRA tour as they have put together some very interesting relationships. And uh, I'm eager to get to know what you gentlemen uh, have presented for us here this week. We've got people from all around the world and uh, their knowledge base is about to expand. Uh, we'll start out with uh, Lake, who is has done a great job with this presentation on a pretty weekly basis with the folks at EPAR Trade. But Lake, this is a little different as we're at the end of the year. Most people have put up their racing equipment and they're looking to go through their off-season refresh. So I think the timing couldn't be better for something like this. Oh yeah, Joe, it's exactly. This is the exact right time for a message like this. Because as you said, uh, engines are coming back in, the season's over, looking ahead. How do I get that next level of performance? How do I make sure that I step up my program? Because it's one thing to maintain your program, but as all racers all know, we're always looking for that next thing. And uh, the off season is where you make a lot of your improvement. And so I think the right time is to start thinking about you know, the what's changed and why. So I have my little background here. That's my dad's uh, cup car from that's 1980, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the old uh, Lake Speed 66. So a lot's changed since 1980 in, in racing. You think about the engine in that car, it was still a small block, 358, 358 cubic inches, really no different uh, than today's NASCAR engine except well, I still had a carburetor on it. It also had iron heads. It had stamped steel rocker arms. I don't even think comp cams had the uh, World War Tip rockers yet in 1980. Uh, they definitely didn't have aluminum heads yet. Still had a flat tappet cam and, and all those kind of things. And it probably had big giant monster 564s or at least 16 uh, rings in it back then. Well, today's engines, we know were completely different. And they live a whole lot longer than just one race. Uh, one you know, story we've told time and time again is that even in the year 2000, so go back you know, 21 years from today, those engines in NASCAR, one race. And when, I mean, when race, we meant not one race weekend, we meant the race because we had qualifying motors, we had practice motors. I remember traveling with the teams, you know, I worked for Melling Racing back then, and we were one of the Dodge teams. And we did. We had a qualifying motor. You had a practice motor. You had a race motor. You shut up at the racetrack with the, qual with the practice motor in. And you ran first practice, and then you changed engines. Put in a qualifying motor. Went out there and qualified, came back, took it out, put the practice motor back in, and then ran practice, then changed and put the race motor in for race day because, oh, my God, you couldn't risk having more miles on the engine because we all knew that those engines at the end of one race would be down five, eight, 10 horsepower or more. Well, that's not the case anymore. They just make more power today than they did then, at least before they were unrestricted. And they live three or four times longer. So the fact that they can run a whole race and not be down on any power. In some cases, they're actually up on power than they were brand new. So that's really kind of the message we want to get across is that, you know, a lot of ways we know racing has changed. You think about that uh, webinar yesterday with Ross Braun talking about where F1's going in, the risk they're taking of making a big change, even though they had a great season, but they're looking ahead to saying, listen, we already know what the problems are. We know how to make it better. Well, one thing we see all the time, and I'm sure Ed and Keith will echo this comment and they can uh, elaborate a little bit. We still see people doing essentially what was done back then, today. And this hasn't changed because yet, will that work? Yeah, I mean, that did run races. It finished races occasionally. But there's so much more out there now. And that's really what we want to try to do is kind of pull that curtain back and not just say, hey, there's potential. Really what we're gonna to do today is tell you how to access and realize that potential so that next year 
you can make more power and go further during the course of the season on the engines you have just with a few simple changes. It's nothing that you're not going to change anyway, but it's what parts you change. Because you're going to refresh the engine. You're going to hone it. You're going to put rings in it. But you have an option now of how you do that and what the results are going to be. So, I mean, uh, Keith, I know you guys, you said it's crazy there today. So talk a little about taking that next step to the racer and how to get them to that next level of thinking. Well, it's very interesting that you just said that because this morning I had a conversation and I, I, I normally don't throw the names out, but old pro stock guy, been around forever, Bob Ingalls. Great yeah. guy, been in this industry forever. Uh, conversation with Bob this morning, he's calling up, working on a big block Chevy. He wants a 0 0.8, 0 0.8, two millimeter combination. This is not a pro stock engine. This is just a great performance big Chevy. His words to me this morning goes, I can't believe anybody still runs a 116th, 116th, 316th. What's wrong with these people? Preach on, brother. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just in a comfort zone. They've got a recipe that they've been using since 1975. It's never bit them. It's never backfired. It's always worked. And they're just, they're in a comfort zone. And we've got to get them out of that zone. You know, they're trying to find everything that they can out of this engine and spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on the trickest cylinder head and, you know, $5,000 on the coolest manifold. And yet there's 20 horsepower sitting right here in a ring pack when they're buying rings anyways. You just got to try something different. And that's how that kind of that conversation was. Because, you know, Bob, as long as he's been doing this, he still wants to find the next thing. He still wants to find the next level. Good enough is not good enough. And he's just amazed at how anybody could still be running that antique ring package. Like you mentioned, that was back in the old 66 car right behind you. Uh, what they ran today, you know, then compared to today, is two totally different things. Yet they're going thousands of race miles, as Lake stated, on the same engines. I remember this is early 2000s going in and, uh, you know, kind of my first exposure into the NASCAR world and walking into the, we'll say, the engine shop that did the engines for the number three car. A lot of us probably still remember that and uh, remember those days. And I'm looking at literally rows of engines, all for the number three car. This half dozen engines, that's Talladega. This half dozen engines, that's going to Charlotte. That it was amazing, you know, how many engines were being built for the one car for the one race. And today they're going there with one and a backup more than likely. Uh, never touched that backup because, you know, they're just so good today. Oh, yeah. And Ed, I know something that has come across a lot, even just this week, and it's only Wednesday, and I think I've already had this conversation at least once a day uh, so far. You talk about, okay, you get a guy that ready, he's ready to make that change in terms of the ring package. But like Keith mentioned, that recipe, and anybody who knows me probably knows what I'm about to say. It's the ring seal soup. It's not just the piston rings by themselves, you know. The old piss, oh, dang it, the filter's killing it. Oh, I hate it. Oh, darn it. Well, anyway, I have to just kind of talk about it as opposed to the, the background filter killing my whiteboard. Um, <laughs> but it's the piston ring interacting with the cylinder wall. Now, so if you got the cylinder wall here and the piston ring contacts it, it's that point of contact where it's the surface finish of the, ring, of the wall, the ring material, the oil, it all has to go together. Um, people, you mentioned, that, hey, this is the ring package. And you got to hone it differently. And they're like, what? So they don't really understand that honing techniques have changed. And sometimes they're like, well, just give me what grit to use. So Ed talk a little bit about how just what grit to use really, I mean, it's one direction, but it's not the whole recipe. Yeah, you're right, uh, Lake. Uh, you, you know, Keith uh, offered up that that these new ring packs will bring or 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 uh, help generate another 20 horsepower. Well, in in our experience, you know, we've been selling the, the, these new machines and and doing this new uh, uh, style of honing to to get a different surface finish that that you guys at Total Seal have have promoted and 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 kind of deemed the, the the proper way of doing things. I mean, I'm getting I'm getting customers uh, you know that do a large amount of motors that are seeing 8 10 14 20 horsepower increases just by 
by changing the honing process, not changing the ring packs, just changing the honing process. So, you know, if you guys can gain 20 horsepower with a, with a different set of rings and, and, and we can gain another, you know, let's be conservative, say 10 horsepower with a, with a different honing process, Holy cow! There's 30 horsepower. You know that, uh, that that's that's pretty big in 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 any form of racing. Uh, so so y- you're completely right. You know I I mean we we talk about this all the time during during the uh, seminars at the NHRA events and 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 we tell customers, you know we're we're not telling you you're doing it wrong. You're you're okay with what, the way you're doing it, and it still works. But there's better ways of doing it, and and this new process with with diamonds and CBN really do or really does seem to make a, a, a huge difference um, in, in in sealing the motor and 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 horsepower. Uh, you know, just just here recently, I've had two customers that I've I've talked to, and and Keith, you were instrumental in one of them, and man, he just he cannot believe how well his motors are sealing. In, in the big performance stuff. He's just, he's absolutely amazed. And it was just he's simply- He's not a dummy either. That's not a, no, that's, that's not a rookie. No, no, this is a, this is a, this is a, no. a very well-known, uh, very astute, very sharp uh, uh, guy that makes a lot of horsepower and a lot of motors and, and uh, does a wide variety, a variety of motors also. So um, he was just amazed. And, and uh, so, yes, you, you know, we've, we've gone to a, a, a diamond as our base finish and and then we've gone we're we're going over the top of that with a cbn abrasive which we believe is a is a better way of doing things than diamonds or standard abrasives it's a very sharp particle and it, and it does a very good job cuts a very clean uh, uh finish and and uh, you get a lot less torn and fragmented metal with it so and so that's one of the big things you're talking about there, Ed, is, okay, so everybody knows about honing and it's been around forever from the old manual ones you can hook to a drill to the vertical, the, the, uh, looks like a, the, the donkey neck ones, right, that move up and down, we've all seen and used. And, 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 but now you guys aren't just being a, on a vertical machine where it's CNC, you're actually talking about the abrasive itself is different and there's something to having that different abrasive material as opposed to the standard conventional abrasives yes sir yep yep you're absolutely right and 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 one of the things is is uh, again we use diamonds and 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 the reason that we use the diamond abrasive it's one of the hardest particles obviously diamonds you know one of the hardest particles known to man but but we use it from an economic standpoint believe it or not a just a just a quick ballpark thing is as a standard abrasive honing three thousandths out of a block uh, mm-hmm. out of eight cylinders is going to cost you anywhere from a buck 80 to 250 a block okay. using diamonds to do that same process will cost you a nickel a block it's it's there's that much uh benefit in going to diamonds they're more expensive to purchase initially but but they will last forever they'll last you our typical diamond abrasives will last 60 to eighty thousand bores so, so we use diamond um, for several reasons. One is, is from an economic point of view, but the other thing is, is we're, we're now putting more abrasives in a honing head. You know, the old days you had two abrasives and two wipers, okay? And we have found through all of our testing that, that um, the more abrasive you put in a hone head, the rounder the cylinder is going to be. And, and there is a law of diminishing returns, but, but the, the, typically the more uh, diamonds you put in or the abrasives you put in a, a, a cylinder hone, the rounder that cylinder will be. So um, so how do you check that, Ed? So I know you said you did some testing. Explain how the testing goes, because I happen to know, because I've been around you enough, that if I take a dowel bore gauge and I put it in a cylinder and I measure it top, bottom, middle, and all that, that's not going to tell me if it's round. No, that's right. You're really just checking size. And, and, you know, your analogy again at the NHRA deals of the slinky is a perfect an- analogy. You know, you can dial board gauge that slinky all the way around and it's going to, and it's going to show, ra- it's going to show the same size, but obviously yeah, it's same, it's same size. Yeah. Uh, so, so what we do is, is we'll take a, and again, I'm, you know, we just happened to, Dart was, uh, 
very generous and 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 gave us a couple of the big M blocks, really thin, thick walls. You know, you're not going to get any uh, bore distortion. You're not going to get any breathing in those those cylinders. So we honed those and and we took you know different hone heads and 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 honed uh, uh, all of these cylinders and sent them up to a. Uh, a company that makes the pat gauge or the incometers. And mm -hmm. that's really the only way you can tell true roundness. A two point contact is it's impossible to tell roundness. It tells size, but it doesn't tell roundness. So, so we sent them to the, the company up there in Michigan incometer and they tested them for us and uh, returned us the results, um, you know, in a, in a paper form. And, and, and we found uh, some substantial improvements when we got away from the two stone and the four stone and got into the six and the eight and the 10 stone uh, honing heads. All right, because they actually have on the pack gauge report, it actually has a, a value for roundness and straightness. And you can, and when you look at them visually, they'll kind of scare the crap out of you because some of them look like a banana and yeah. some of them look like a grapefruit. And you're like, how does my ring see with that possible? Right. You know, but it, again, it goes back to the, you're looking at microns there, so well, that's right. They're 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 measuring in forty millionths of an inch. <laughs> you, you know where where typically if if uh, we're being super accurate, we're measuring with a tenth reading indicator, which is two and a half microns. You know, so uh, per tenth. So so yeah. So, all right. So I think we need at this point. People are probably listening. Like, okay, this is interesting. I, I'm catching on, but in the back of your mind is like, okay, where. When did all this start? How did this come about? Because like you said, uh, Ed, it's not about that you're doing it wrong. Because I mean, there are guys who run vintage stock cars, just like that one. And they'll still go out there and you can build that engine the same way it was built back then. And it'll still go run 500 miles. It, it, you can still do it the old way. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. No, It's just not the most efficient way. Now, Keith, to me, you're the disciple of this. You're the guy that probably saw this happening first and as you always say if, if a, a racer is going to the race and they have a flat tire on the way to the racetrack that was probably the piston ring it did it right because <laughs> there's somewhere in this evolution of change things were difficult at first it wasn't like oh we came up with this new ring and we instantly knew here's how you hone it with diamonds and cbn and it's just boom ring seal soup first first go so Tell us about that, that pain and that struggling of how to get to where we are today. Well, I appreciate that. And in some cases, it, you know, it has been a little painful. It's, it's not always easy to lead the horse to water. You, know, you can lead the horse to water, like say, but you can't make it break. And, and, and getting folks to understand that, you know, from the piston ring point of view, uh, you know, we do, a, you know, I don't want to say we're perfect, but we do a pretty good job. You know, we make it flat, we make it round, we make it light tight. Uh, what more can I make it do? It, you know, if, if I check it and every dimension on the part is right, it's as good as I can make it. It's the environment that it has to work in. If, if I'm trying to put that perfectly round peg, you know, into a, a we'll say, not perfectly round hole, something maybe a little more squarish, uh, we're going to have deficiency. We're going to have blowback. We're going to have leakage. We're going to have a, we are going to have a reduction in the possible power output that engine can make. I, I, you know, I don't want to say you're losing something, but you're not getting it all. Uh, you know, talking about the, the honing, you know, issue earlier with the gentleman that found the power. This guy is extremely well known. His issue was he was leaving something on the table. Did he have a problem with ring seal? Nope. Was he having an oil control problem? Nope. It just wasn't as good as it could have been. So from my side, it's been working with this since the early 2000s. Okay, we've done our part. I get parts back. I look at them. We look at the barrel profile. We look at, you know, you know, how light tight it is, how flat parallelism, we've done everything, but yet the engine didn't perform the way we hoped or expected it could. So now we have to start diving into the external, the ancillary components, you know, the cylinders, the piston, how good are the ring grooves? And that's been kind of the uphill challenge for us is we've, we've got so many decades of information that have been passed down, you know, mother to daughter, father to son, grandfather to father, you know, this is how we do it. This is the way it is. Well, that's how we did it then because that's all we knew and that was all the equipment that we had access to. Today, we've got profilometers, pad anchometers. We've got homes that are you know, CNC operated. They're looking at the cylinder, correcting bore geometry. Uh, you know, Ed had commented about going from a two stone head to say a six or an eight stone head. 
And, and trust me, when you take a, you know, you don't have to have an intimeter. When you take and put a six stone hone head in that block coming from something that was honed in a two stone head and that thing's shaking and quaking and making all kinds of noises uh, because you're down in the bottom of the block and the bottom of the block anything but round, even though you thought it was. Uh, again, it's great to have that ink meter, but when you put that six stone head in there and it's like, holy cow, what just happened? That just shows you that board geometry, how that's different. And that's such a critical part of achieving, you know, we'll say not losing ring seal to that one other piece of the puzzle. Uh, I, I could keep going on and on and on about it. Uh, and, and it's really great through, you know, the efforts of, of Ed and Lake uh, and others out there. Uh, you know, people are, just, you know, they're starting to open their eyes to this and say, hey, uh, it's not what I thought it was. It's not as good as I thought it was. And again, that's not saying that you're doing anything wrong. It's just not as good as what we hoped it was. Gentlemen, we'll uh, Lake, I, I see, Lake, I see you have uh, a, a device over there. We're going to ask you to, to show us exactly what it is and what it does in a second. But I do want to mention to everybody out there that if you do have a question or want to take the conversation in a certain direction or maybe have the guys uh, go a little deeper into something they said, you can use the chat section. That's what it's there for. Uh, we might not get to it immediately, but I am constantly monitoring the chat section while these guys are uh, going on this deep dive. Uh, if you do have a question, you want to double back, put it in the chat section, leave your name, and I will pose the question to Lake, Ed, and Keith together. Lake, back to you. All right, so this is the profilometer Keith was referring to. And it's a surface measuring device. It can measure the surface of anything. In fact, I'll measure the whiteboard, which I'm going to try holding it up one more time again. Oh, you can see barely possibly. Ah, it's just kind of technical difficulties there. But that was my bad drawing, right? Can I flip it around and you can see it? Oh, I'm trying, trying, trying. There we go. Trying. Oh, sort of see some of it. It's there for a second and it's gone. Too damn smart computer. It, it, it's like a green screen. No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. No, it was good. Yeah, here I was <laughs> trying to be helpful, but I'll actually put it on the whiteboard and I'll take a trace of the whiteboard because it can measure any surface. You can use profilometers not just to measure the surface of a cylinder. They're really great for measuring the surface of a deck, uh, cylinder heads to make sure the gasket seal properly. You know, because it, it's surface roughness and surface finish to me is the unknown variable in motorsports, not just engines, in motorsports. Because as a tribologist who studies friction, wear, and lubrication, and you wouldn't think about it, but you know, tribology, that's also when you walk across a waxed floor. Why do we wax a floor? So you don't fall and bust your butt. We're actually creating friction. So tribology isn't always about reducing friction. It's a nice thing to reduce friction for efficiency, but sometimes you need friction. Think automatic transmission fluid. If you are got a power glide and you've got a pro mod, you need the clutch to lock up. You don't want it to slip. So be able to use friction, turn it on and off as you need it. That's a big part of tribology. So surface roughness is a big part of it. So here's the surface roughness of this whiteboard which, you know, again, it looks nice and smooth and flat, but in reality is, man, this thing's got an RVK of 26, an RK of 66. I got a page over and let's take a look at the, uh, so this is what, you're probably not gonna be able to see it very good because of the stupid screen. Yep. It's gonna act like a dumb dumb. Forward, yeah, there you go, it's up. But just gonna give it a second. Okay, there we go. Ah, bingo. You can see that kind of surface trace right there. Now watch this. We're gonna look at the bearing curve, right? So Keith, why don't you explain to them what the bearing curve is as this thing is gonna go out here in a second and they'll be able to actually see it because the, the backlight, boom, there you go. Yeah, she finally died down. Uh, it, it, you know, bearing curve is you know, referred to, you know, uh, some people just call it the bearing curve, it's the added Firestone curve. Uh, what you're looking there, is the percentage of material, we'll call it above the mean center line versus the percentage of material below the mean center line. Uh, that, that number is extremely handy in, in, again, reading ratios. How much do we have, we'll say, push, you know, sticking its way through the oil film? How much do we have below the oil film? So if you have a, a newer profilometer that has the ability to measure RPK, you know, the peak roughness, 
RK, the core roughness or your bearing area, uh, and RVK, the valley roughness, that's, you know, we'll simplify it, call that your oil retention. Just because, you know, think about it like this, folks, just because you're throwing oil at the cylinder wall doesn't mean that oil clings to the cylinder wall. It's got to have something to grab a hold of. And if it can't grab that surface, the rings are going to try to scrape it back off. If it's a vacuum engine, it's going to try to suck it back down off the cylinder wall, put it back into the sump. Uh, and again, as much as you think you're putting oil up there, we have a dry bore or, a, you know, a overly dry cylinder. So, if you've got an earlier profometer that will only measure RA, hopefully it can measure the bearing curve. And what we're typically looking for is what is known as the MR1 or the percentage of material above the curve to be high single digit number to very low double, preferably about 8%, maybe 9%. Then the area below, which is referred to as the MR2, we're looking for that number to be somewhere in the high 70 to low 80% range. 78, 79, 80, 81%. That's explaining to me how much, you know, how much plateau do I have on the cylinder? So if I've got an RA of a 16 and I've got an RZ of, let's just say, you know, 140, I've got my MR1 at 8%, my MR2 at 78%, I can feel confident that I've got a pretty good plateau on that surface. Now, if I had those same RA numbers, but I've got an MR1 of 15 or 20 percent and an MR2 of 60 percent, I know I don't have a good plateau. So even if you have an older profilometer, you can, using the bearing curve, look at, you know, and establish whether you've got a good plateau or not. And that's so critical in today's world. We want instant gratification. We want to put that thing in the car, on the dyno, light it up, bang, everything's done. A uh, big part of that is you know, allowing that ring to seat in and again, a ring will correct an incorrect surface finish. It will wear it in in time, but nobody really wants to wait for that anymore. Uh, those days are long gone. We want it now and we want it right. Yeah, so I kind of funny, Keith, is that even just measuring the whiteboard, an RA20, that's not all that uncommon no. for a, surface, a cylinder board surface finish. But these numbers are terrible for a cylinder board. Uh, the RK is so high. So the RK, which is your core roughness, is essentially double what the valley is. So why don't you talk a little bit about, Keith, about why that valley, that RVK, is so critical and how that relates to the bearing curve. Because I think this is almost, a, by mistake, a great example of what not to do. <laughs> but, but it's fairly common, though, right? I mean, this is not like you never see this. Oh, no, as you said, like, that's pretty much an everyday phone call. Uh, when you don't have the profilometer, uh, it, it's just, you know, you can't see this with the eyes. As, as we know, we're talking about micro inches here. Uh, the surface finish, when you're dealing with this, when we're talking, you know, an RVK of 50, you know, that's, that, that's 50 micro inches. You're talking very, very small numbers here. This is not a, a visual thing. You can't say, oh, yeah, I honed it. It looks really good. Well, there is a look to a good silver. We want it light, bright, very light, silvery in color. We don't want it black or dark or dull. That indicates a burnished cylinder. But these numbers are so small, you just can't see these with your eyes. So as Lake explained, we've got to have a relatively high RVK number, that valley depth. All the numbers matter. I never want to tell anybody that the numbers, you know, oh, you, this one doesn't matter. You can throw that out. They all matter. But the number that I see missed the most is the RVK, that valley depth, which is such an important number. It's oil retention. Again, as Lake explained, it's a soup. It's a recipe. I've got to keep the ring lubricated. I've got to cool the ring. I've got to cool the piston. Uh, I've seen so many pistons that come in scuffed up that has nothing to do with anything other than the bore finish isn't right. We're not lubricating the skirt of the piston. So getting that valley number is so critical. Now, as far as the RK number, we typically like to see the RK number about 10 points below the RVK. Can it be a little bit lower than that or maybe about the same? Yeah, you can get away with it. But what I don't want to see is a runaway RK, a number that's you know 100 RK and an RVK of a 50. Those numbers are already lopsided. And as discussed earlier, will the engine eventually correct it? Yeah, but by the time it does that, the rings are going to be chewed out of it and there will be no RVK left when it's all said and done. You pull the engine apart at the end of the life cycle, which will be very short because the block wore out so quickly. There's no valley left. There's no oil retention left. And then the third number, the RPK, the peak roughness, 
that's the roughness the ring's actually going to see on that initial start, that cold start where there's no lubrication on the board. This is the part the ring's actually going to come into contact with. So if that number is excessively high, what's it going to do? It's going to scuff the face of the ring. It's going to tear it up. And the ring is going to return that favor back to the cylinder. You tear the face of the ring up, what's it going to do? It's going to, you know, it's going to scuff the bore up. So now we've got a tore up cylinder. Everything's pissing each other off. And you've got an engine that goes to heck in a handbasket relatively quick. At the same time, I don't want that number so low that it doesn't help to wear or lap the imperfections that are going to be still in the ring, still in the cylinder. Remember, folks, the final machining process of all this is the running, right. is that initial breaking. The best equipment in the world, the best parts in the world still have to mate together. Just like new brake pads do a new brake rotor, they've got to wear in. Lifters, flat tap it, lifter in a cam, they've got to wear in. So it's so critical that these numbers be correct to give that engine the best opportunity it has for quick, correct ring seating. And Ed, so talk a little bit about how to get to these correct numbers, because as we mentioned, we, we, you go out there and just check bores in the field with, in shops that don't have one of these things, more times than not, they look like this, not where they're supposed to look. Yep, yep. So so one of the first things I see in Keith and, and Lake, I think you guys will, will uh, agree with me here, is as we get fellas that think they're plateauing by, they go in with a 220 grit, and they leave three thousandths in there and then they hone the next uh, two thousandths out with a 280 grit and then they go in with a 400 grit and take five tenths out or, or or what have you and then they may even go in with a 600 grit and take a couple of tenths out again we're talking about microns 40 millionths of an inch i can tell you when you do that your base finish is whatever the last abrasive you use there is no plateau it is a base finish and, and if you're using a 400 grit uh, abrasive and, and, and you take a few tenths out with, you're, you know, you're gonna get a low RA, you're gonna get a low RPK. You're also gonna get a very low RVK. So, so you have no oil uh, 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 controlling or, or, or ability to hold oil there in the cylinders. So we've tried to, again, with Keith's help and Lake's help and, and, and outlining what they believe a, the good bore should look like. And, and, you know, I always let those guys tell me what finishes they want. I'm not smart enough to, to give you that. I'm smart enough to tell you how to get it. I'm not smart enough to tell you what the ring should have. But, but typically, uh, you know, Keith will tell me anything from a 10 to 20 RPK and, and uh, then we jump down to RVK and it's very application sensitive, not ring material sensitive, but application sensitive, you know, on a, on a blown motor or, or a big nitrous motor or something like that. Keith will tell me he wants, you know, 65 plus or maybe even a little higher RVK number. And then on the RK number, he'll want 10 to 15 points lower than that. And so to get that, we start with a, a rough diamond, a base finish, and we actually hone to size with that diamond. Uh, so let's say we're wanting the 65 RBK. To get something like that, I'm gonna probably go in there with a 170 uh, diamond or maybe even a 140 grit diamond, depending on the Brunel hardness of the block. And the key there is, is I wanna use that profilometer that Lake's got held up right there. I use that as, as kind of a, a uh, no uh, go, no go gauge. So after I start honing my cylinder, before I get to size, I throw that uh, profilometer in there and I check for RVK. And if I'm wanting to obtain a 65 RVK, I need to have 80, 90, 100 RVK or more uh, in the in the rough bore before I ever go in with a with a, a fine CBN abrasive and knock some of those peaks off. I can't start with a 65 and expect to get a 65 after plateauing. So it's real you can't key. Start with a 50 or a no, that's right. Or a 40. No, you exactly. Never get there. Right. 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 So so you have to start with a very rough surface, which freaks a lot of people out because that's not the normal way of doing things. Uh, so, you mentioned, Ed, not to interrupt you, but no, just for the perspective for scale, 
you mentioned uh, oh, that old way of doing it was to go within three thousandths of size and then change abrasives and then go within maybe a thousandths or, or five tenths uh, of size and then go from there. Right. Well, the reality is, so on your dial board gauge, a, a tenth is, you know, say two tenths is one tenth per side. Correct. Okay. Right. One tenth is 100 microns. That's right. 100 micro inches. Yep. This scale is 160. So the entire surface finish is 160. So which reality is if you take out more than two tenths on the gauge, you've taken out pretty much most of what's there. That's right. Excellent. And I think that's it. It's like, the, it's like, stop. Rewind, listen to it again, because the idea of going within a thousandths of size and then taking that the last thousandths, that's too much. That's your, whatever you need is going to be gone. That's right. You're absolutely correct, Lake. And that's probably the biggest change in the honing process, I suspect, uh, uh, you know, that anybody's seen. And so, you know, we'll go in after that rough uh abrasive then we'll go in with this uh and again depending on if you want lower portion of the rpk number or higher portion of the rpk number we'll either go in with a 600 or a 500 grit cbn and and we'll do it by a few strokes we're not taking i customers freak out about this i tell them to hone it to size and they're going yeah but what happens after you plateau it i said you're not going to be able to measure it you, you, there, it's you know you're not going to be able to measure that small amount of stock that, that that we took out, and so that kind of brings up also you know not only is the abrasive changed and the technology for that and 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 the technology and the hone heads, but the equipment has to change also. You, you know when when we talk to guys, we're talking about six stroke versus five strokes or or six strokes versus seven strokes. I mean. And, and pressures, you know, you want to hold your pressures. And so when, when you're trying to do that with a manually operated piece of equipment, it's very, very, very um, uh, operator sensitive. And so what you may have in one bore is perfect. And then by the time you get to the other end of the block, it's way off in left field. And, and so it's a very difficult process if you're trying to do it manually. In other words, if, if you're starting a machine and the hone, a perfect example, if, you're, if you start a, 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 hone, a machine and you're feeding the stones out and the, and the hone head is spinning while those stones are feeding out, you, you, you've absolutely destroyed your plateau at the top of the cylinder. Might be great in the bottom of the cylinder, but last time I looked, compression or, or explosion and, and yeah. everything happened at the top. So you've ruined your plateau finish at the top of the cylinder. So, um, you know, it's, it's the technology is advanced. And, and uh, uh, like I said, I, I, I'm just amazed. I had a really good customer does a lot of roundy round motors, a lot of them. And, you know, he bought one of our brand new automated machines that hones the entire block unattended. And, and we were talking and I said, you know, I, I think you're going to see a horsepower. I'm not interested in I'm not looking for horsepower. I'm I, I just looking for automation. He called me uh, like two days. He, he, he'd honed a couple of blocks while I was there. They built them. They put them on a dyno. And, and it's a very, I don't want this to sound, it's a cookie cut. In other words, they build the same motor day after day after day after day. He saw 14 horsepower increase just, just by changing his honing method. Right. That's the only thing he changed. Wow. 14 horsepower. He was ecstatic. And on that note, guys, let me jump in because we do have a question from Jim out there that is kind of in the, hey, quantify this for us realm. And so do your best with this, uh, Lake or Keith or, or Ed, if you want to jump in. But Jim says for the average guy building a performance V8, what's the difference in friction between a 112 ring pack versus a 116, 116, 316 pack? How much power could be freed up assuming proper bore finish? versus improper bore finish. So can we can we quantify where it was to where it is now? Yeah, I can tell you exactly. I mean, so people that know me know that I've been doing testing out at Ronnie Shaver's place for 15 years. 
we have a little mule motor there that we know what exactly what that engine makes. It's got literally thousands and thousands of dyno pulls on it. And uh, back during COVID, because we were, couldn't go anywhere and do anything, but I could sneak in there, uh, we decided to run a 16th, 16th, 316th ring package and compare it to our 0.7. Now, that's what we had as our baseline package. And the reason why we wanted a 0.7 is we do endurance testing on that engine. So if I'm going to run high engine speed for hours upon end, I need to reduce friction. So before I even work for Total Seal, I had called Keith and said, this is what we're trying to, build, trying to do. This is what we're trying to achieve. What ring package do I need? And he's like, you need the diamond finish 0.7s. We put it in there and pff, I mean, all the cooling problems we had went away. Everything was great. But to answer the question, what's that number? Uh, it was 22 horsepower from a 16th, 16th, 316th down to a um, 0.7.72 millimeter. Wow. And there you go, the quantification of it. Um, hopefully, Jim, that answers your question. And, and then, more importantly, Joe, and for yes. Jim, uh, it wasn't just 22 horsepower. It was also about 30 degrees of water temperature. Because people think, and I was just, again, emailed this week already, conversation with a guy, well, I need that thick ring because I got to transfer the heat out of the, out of the piston. Okay, that thin ring can transfer heat. It, it can move enough heat because it's not only the ring moving the heat. The oil that's splashing up from the crankcase is also pulling heat out of the piston. When I reduce friction in the ring, I'm reducing heat. If you rub your hands together, they get warm. It's friction. The more pressure, the bigger the area, the more friction, the more heat that's generated. The ability to reduce the heat in the engine was probably actually more significant than anything else. Uh, because now my tuning window, what can I do for octane and my fuel? All those things open up because, because of that. Yeah, but anyway, I, I could go on for hours just about that one topic because it, it was one of the things that the guys in the shop, they all freaked out. I mean, these are guys who have been engine, building engines forever, and we all knew there was going to be a horsepower gain there. But when the water temperature was so different, that's when we were all scrambled around. Okay, what did we do wrong? What, what, what's this? I mean, we checked everything in the cooling system. And then we finally realized, wait, hang on. Let's repeat the test. Let's go backwards. Do all the work, go backwards, which we had time to kill just during COVID, right? We spent a whole week out there back and forth. And it's like, oh, damn, it really is the, the rain package doing that. And Amazing. that's the only difference. Well, and there you go. Hopefully, Jim, that works for you. And the other question, Doug, and I think, I don't know if this is a serious question, but it might be, as in profilometer, is that gizmo available as a phone app? Which the answer <laughs> I, mean, uh, I don't know if it's true, true man. I don't think so. I think it's uh, maybe Maybe our buddy Mark Marburg keeps working on some kind of, you know, way to use the phone <laughs> in the cam camera phone yeah. and make some kind of optical thing that'd be cool. Yes, well, but if gonna, you do I'm decide to throw that out there, because you know, in the in the world of 3D metrology, which is you know a profilometer on mega steroids, uh, the optical you know information you can get is unbelievable. It is absolutely insane. And yeah, we got to talk to Mark about trying to develop a phone app because uh, that'd be at awesome. Point in time, I yeah. know the optical machine won't even fit inside the cylinder. You have to cut the cylinder in half to look at it. Uh, boy, that'd be a handy app, wouldn't it? That would be really cool. I, I, I'd be I'd be all in for that. Yeah. Yes, guys. And just remember that I'm the one who thought of it. So okay. Credit yeah. right, right to Joe. Call the yep. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so Doug. Out there. Day C two thousand. That's game. right. Yes. Um, and so Keith, tell, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about why? What what was the what was the one technical development that kind of opened this Pandora's box, if we will, of surface finish because. I know you know where I'm going with this because there was a date and time where, hey, man, you didn't have to worry about this stuff. You just kind of put a 280 finish in it and let it rip. But then something changed in terms of ring technology that put the onus of surface finish back on the cylinder wall. Well, and, and yeah, and there's, there's more than one event that happened there. But, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just 
we'll say a quick evolution of, of mm -hmm. rings and blocks. You know, up until the very late 90s, early 2000s, I mean, the iron materials that we worked with were pretty much whatever we could get our hands on, which was going to be an OE grade of iron. So you're talking in Brunel numbers, 150, 160 Brunel. If you were lucky to get one of those high nickel blocks, uh, mm -hmm. you might be into the 170s, 180s on a good day. So the block materials have evolved. They've gotten significantly harder. At the same point in time, we had molly filled rings. We had a very soft coating, very porous, held oil like a sponge, uh, probably the most forgiving thing you could get your hands on uh, at the time. So we had big, thick rings, 16th inch rings, uh, 3 16th oil rings. It made 20 pounds of tension. Compression rings were five, six pounds of tension each. You know, relatively soft blocks, relatively soft coating. I'll throw it out, and I'm really oversimplifying. Heck, my sister could get that right. You can hold it with a Scotch Bright pad and a two by four, and more than likely, it's going to work because and people did that, by the way. The rings could have fixed it, but as the blocks got harder and the rings got thinner, we went from blocks that were 170, 180 Brunel to 220, 250. Today, they're over 300. There's some exotic cylinders that are over 500, significantly harder parts. And we've gone to hard coatings. We've gone to very thin rings with very light tensions. Uh, Lake had mentioned the 0.7 millimeter ring. A 0.7 millimeter top and second ring make less than a pound of force compared to a 16th inch ring that's typically five, six pounds of force. You're looking at a three sixteenths oil ring that's 20 pounds of force compared to a two millimeter that could be anywhere from three to 10 pounds of force. Very, very light tension with a hard PVD coating that doesn't absorb or hold oil like a molly. So because of these, you know, let's say evolutions in block material, ring materials, ring coatings, that quick seating window of what we had back in the old days, soft blocks with soft coatings that could get away with just about anything, Today, we're dealing with parts that, as, as Lake mentioned, we can go 4,000 race miles on them. That's because the blocks are so much harder, the coatings are so much better, the friction is so much lower. Will that thin, lightweight ring package eventually fix a bad cylinder finish? Yes, it will eventually correct that cylinder finish, but not in your lifetime. <laughs> So those are the things that have evolved. The coatings are much harder. The blocks are much harder. So through the honing process, we have to do what the rings do naturally. They will, you know, you could put a rough bore finish on it and they'll eventually wear it down to where you want it to be. But again, it's going to take forever. We have to do that through the honing process. We have to get it as close to what it needs to be. And we're going to get an engine that's going to run in very quickly. It's going to seat the rings in almost immediately. If you're more than two or three hits on the dyno to get a set of rings to come in and get that, you know, get that peak power number and get that blow by number. If you're more than that, there's something wrong. There's something is off in the cylinder finish. The days of 10, 15, 20 hits. Hey, I'm at 30 hits. Boy, she's really coming in now. Uh, yeah. those, those days, that's way, way wrong. So the evolution has been the ring itself, the coating, the block, oils, which we haven't touched on yet, and the access to that profilometer, access to this type of equipment at reasonable cost. Uh, you know, I've told this story many, many times, but I remember going to work with Richard Maskin and Paul Hoskins at DART, you know, in the very, very early 2000s on their pro stock program. Keeping in mind, folks, this is a championship winning engine program. This is not a back marker piece that's trying to get into the show. Went there, we walked out of their shop up 13 horse average, which you know, anybody in pro stock or in your racing, give your IT for that. It was simply getting the cylinder finished the same in all eight holes. We're back to, it wasn't that they were bad. They didn't have a problem. They just weren't as good as they could have been. And that's the guys, evolution of access to this kind of equipment. Guys, we're on the home stretch here. So before we uh, part ways, and, and uh, I'm excited always to see Francis, but this is just such a rapid fire, fast moving conversation. Uh, give the vital information, Lake. I know there's going to be people with questions. Totalseal.com is the website. You guys have made some updates recently where people can purchase individual rings on yeah. the website. You guys totally redid your website. There is a podcast that I am very familiar with. I know we got a lot of podcast listeners out there and some great episodes very recently. Keith is one of the hosts, as am I, in full disclosure, Frank Iaconio, Gary Stinnett, Jason Line, Pat Musi, they all like reveal 
secrets and, and deep dives into their methodology and their careers. That's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But talk a little bit about the website, Lake, and where people can go to find more information because you are, you've are you taken this as a mission to really educate people out there here on EPAR Trade, Industry Week, of course, and uh, other places. Let us know. Yeah, sure. So totalsealed.com, like you mentioned, is the website. And really, it's kind of the portal to many different things. There's information about the rings on there. But like you said, our YouTube channel is packed with videos. They go on and on. Uh, different webinars we've done, a lot of history uh, on these things where you can get that deeper dive into that and you've got more visuals. So uh, I would definitely go to, to the Total Seal YouTube channel. And of course, you know, all of us together, uh, between Rottler and Total Seal, uh, everybody, you know, we're working on the Engine Performance Expo, which is coming up in January, where again, even deeper, more technical dive into all of this. Um, but then, like you mentioned too, the podcast is another great way of you know kind of tapping into the thought process. You know, it was one thing that you know Gary was talking about. Is he goes, it's not what to what you know, it's how to think. Because it's if it's great if you have the one part that does a really great job. And in, in the NASCAR world, we always call it the magic spring, right? If the crew chief and if, if Hammond's out there watching this thing still, he'll know what I'm talking about. If you have the magic right front spring, you can get you around Charlotte, then you can get around Charlotte until they change the tire or something else, then you're hunting for the magic spring again. But if you know why that spring could get you around Charlotte, now you can figure out how to go to Michigan or Pocono or anywhere else and get around the racetrack and go fast. So it, it's, I mean, those are the kind of things that you learn in the podcast because those guys are telling those secrets. If you listen, they're dropping those nuggets along the way. So yeah, you know, like you said, we're, you know, myself, Keith, Ed, all of us, We've, you know, a lifetime of experience doing this. We just, you want to see people do well. Yeah, I hate to see people spend good money and work so hard to have 80% of what they could have if they just made a few changes. You're going to put the work in anyway. I mean, if you got to rebuild an engine, it takes time to hone it. It takes time to machine it and bolt it together. You, you want to bolt together 500 horsepower? Or you want to bolt together 550 horsepower? I take 550 every time. No well, substitute for horsepower. Right, yeah. a couple of changes, and I'm building together 550 versus 500. That's and right. I would then not have to re rebuild it again in 500 miles. I'd much rather go 1,000 miles or further before I have to rebuild it again. So what we're trying to do is just give some tips and tricks along the way. You know, when I was at Driven and we were doing the oil program, one of the things I would always say, is that you know Home Depot, FedEx, and M and M's never asked us how much money we spent on oil. All they wanted to know is how many races we win, how many changes we win. And we would go and do seminars talking about oil, and I said, "Listen, thank Home Depot, FedEx, and M and M's for this, because they're the ones who paid for all this. We didn't pay for it; they paid for it, and they're allowing us to share with you what they learned because." And we just want to give that on. So that was kind of the ethos of where we came from, you know, at Joe Gibbs Racing was we wanted to share certain things that we learned to help the industry because the industry helps us. It's given me a great career. And so this is our way of trying to help out and give back, back to, I'd rather see somebody spend 50 bucks more and make 50 more horsepower than, and make the engine live longer than, just do what they've always done and get the same thing they've always had. That's boring to me. I'm Excellent. always about continuous improvement, right? Lake, Keith, Ed, thank you very much. This was uh, illuminating as is usual. I see Francisque and Judy are back. Lady, yes. welcome back. How about that? What a great thank, presentation. Thank, thank, thank you very much. And, and Lake, you're spot on. And, and Lake is a little genius. And, and we all, I mean, we, we, we're getting tons of support and credit for what we do, but let's go back to its roots. It started with Lake. It started from a phone call back <laughs> June two years ago where we thought, what else can we do to help the industry? And we started our first ever webinar. We, I didn't even know what a webinar was for you at that time. <laughs> and and it, was, it was just like magical. And then from there, we had we have, I mean, we have had Lake and Ed and Keith and Ed, you know, with us probably three or four times now. They are coming back at the end of the week with Driven, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, 
going to be talking about oil analysis. So it's really, it's a combined effort. Uh, uh, and, and I commend you, Lake and, and Ed and Keith for everything you're doing, because now you're doing also at the track with Matt's team uh, on site. And, and that's really good. And, uh, and let's, uh, you know, one of the things we were saying this morning when we opened the, the show with Paul and, and Jeff and Judy is online offers incredible opportunities to connect anytime, anywhere you are. And that's magical. The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing, and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade, there is no e-commerce. It's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPART trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR Trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. There are two types of people, racers and everyone else. Racer Magazine is for those who believe that racing is a way of life. Racer embodies the excellence that defines a sport driven by passion, courage, and ingenuity. Get one year of both Racer's print and digital edition for only $39 with instant access to our entire digital issue archive. Subscribe now at info.racer.com.